I get the privilege to share the word again with you. Uh, I got to share a couple weeks ago. And uh, last time I preached to your pocketbooks. This time I'm going to preach to your priorities. But no, it's a privilege to uh, be up here and uh, stand behind the pulpit. And for uh, Pastor Paul and Sister Vicky, they're away right now on a, a family holiday. They'll be back next week. And so it is, a, I count it a great honor to be here when he's, uh, he's not here. Amen. And um, so thank God for him. And it's a blessing. I, I don't take it lightly to share the word. I put in the effort to study. Thank God for my wife because she puts up with me as I get into the word and I get like, I get locked in, and I'm like, yeah, get away from me. I can't focus when you're around. So I'll praise God for her. And then also, it's just a privilege to share in this house because uh, there's, how many love the pastors here, the other pastors that are here, and the ministers and the men of God, and I respect them and admire them, and so it's a, it's a privilege to come share in this house. And um, So hopefully this is not going to be too harsh of a word. Is this too loud? Can you turn me down right here? I feel like I'm yelling at myself. Um, but before we do, actually, we have a testimony. Where's, uh, where's Oyen at? I don't want to call her up, but she came and asked Oyen, is she in here? Oh, she's in the children. We're not going to call her up, but she asked me, no, you don't have to call her. She, she wanted me to share a testimony. Uh, last time I preached, we had an altar call and we said, hey, if you need a miracle, you need God to do something and break through financially. She came and told me this morning, hey, God, God moved. And when I came up and I, I had a need and I, I lifted it up to the Lord and, uh, she said right here, she was trusting God for a permanent position, and it came through. She said, just two days after she came to the altar, she got a call, and she went from a contract job, but she went to the permanent job. Amen? And so that's what she came forward for. So I just wanted to share. She shared that with me, and I wanted to share it with you because God is a miracle-working God. and He's got all the power, and he's able to do what you need him to do. Amen? And then also, I want to uh, welcome uh, Sister Alice. I don't want to embarrass you, but Andy, uh, Andy is one of the staff in the home, and that's uh, his wife. She's here visiting, so welcome. We love you. We're glad that you're here. Praise God. Well, let's get into the word this morning. Uh, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to read this, and then we'll, we'll pray. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. It says right here, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, that he may be first, that he may not just be first, but that he may hold the first place. Let's pray one more time. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for the expectation and the atmosphere that you set this morning. We open our hearts to you. We ask that you would move by your power, by your spirit. Move us, God. Align our priorities with you being first in every area of our lives. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. That he may have preeminence, that he may be first, that he may hold the first place. I think we could all agree, like, we all like, yeah, Jesus should be number one, right? We all agree that. But that's because we're in church right now. But once we leave this place, that kind of changes because circumstances change. Needs change. Desires change. Relationships, the people I'm around change a little bit. And so sometimes it begins to, in the house on Sunday morning, Jesus is number one. But after this, on Monday morning, something shifts sometimes when I'm at school, when I'm at work, when I'm facing the things of the day and the week. But Jesus should be first in every area of our lives. I've heard it said that, you know, there's an order of life, God, family, and ministry. You ever heard that before? God first, then family, then ministry. But the reality is that God should be first in every one of those areas of our life. First in family, first in ministry, first in your career, first in your education. In every one of these areas, God is first. 
And that's how we live a life that we, we're able to do the things that we need to do. Serving God full time. Working full time. Being a full time dad or mom. Being a husband or a wife. How am I able to do it? Because God is number one in all of these areas of my life. I don't pick and choose which ones I do. One more thing before we go. I want to say, uh, how many uh, love the United We Can presentation? It's good stuff, huh? Good stuff. I, I say that because uh, we, were, we were at the house and Christina came down this morning. She's like, man, the American pastor is preaching in Manchester on United We Can Sunday as he gets ready to go into Dublin. Woo, come on, it's United We Can Day. And then I said, guess what? I don't know why it makes sense, but I'm wearing a Thailand shirt. <laughs> this is my only, uh, you know, my cultural gear that I have. <laughs> and I told you guys once, a couple of months ago, that uh, I'd come dressed as a cowboy to represent America. And when I, when I could get the gear for it, I'm going to come dressed as a cowboy on a United We Can Sunday. I'm going to come like this. And maybe I'll be a part of the day. Maybe I'll have holsters, uh, no guns in it. Maybe Nerf guns from the kids or something. Come on, bud. Bam. But no, it, United We Can, it, give to it. it. It is, I'm a United We Can supporter. Looking forward to see what God does in that, through that. Amen. I don't know why I got there, but I just wanted to share that with you. Good stuff this morning. So here we are. Back to the word, come back here, that he may have preeminence, that in every area of our lives that God should be first. Let me tell you this story. It reminds me, well, go back real quick, that he should be first. Why does he not be first sometimes? What happens that God gets bumped out of position sometimes? Does that ever happen to you, or am I the only one? Come on, talk to me a little bit this morning. I, I, is that sometimes, like I said, on Sunday morning, we're singing the songs and the worship is good. And then after, on Wednesday or on Thursday or on Friday, my priorities have shifted. I don't want to come to church on Wednesday because I had a bad day at work. I had a bad this or it was tough that. Sometimes things shift in our lives. There's storms, there's trials, there's different things that we face. And then our priorities begin to shift, and Jesus no longer is preeminent, but he's second place or third place or even lower. But how do we get there? What, what happens? In, uh, there's the distractions of the world, the desires of our hearts. How many like living comfortable? Hey, there you go. Hey, come on. God bless one of you. Amen. We like that. We desire that. It's the Western culture, right? We want to just get to a place where we could chill and we got the, the right size house and the, the nice car that I don't have to worry about breaking down here and there. My kids are okay. They don't act crazy, right? They got the things that they need. I want to be comfortable. What's wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. But unless it takes the preeminence, unless it takes the first place, it takes priority of what God wants to be doing within my life. The world tastes good. Somebody say amen. The world tastes good. The comforts, the pleasures that the world offers, it, it, it's nice. If you're honest, you like to sin. Hello, somebody. Right? You like to do the things you just shouldn't do. We see it in our kids, our young kids. They do the opposite of what they should be doing. Why? Because it feels good. There's a story I remember uh, in high school in America. I think I was about 15, 16. It's in, in, high, in high school in America, that's your ninth grade. Freshman year, ninth year. And I was 15 or 16, I think. And uh, we had an English class. And uh, I don't remember much from high school. Uh, but I remember this class. And I remember the teacher, the English teacher. His name was Mr. Sipsy. I don't know why I remember that. I don't remember all my other teachers. I remember him. His name was Mr. Sipsy. I remember uh, two or three things about him in this class. One, he was kind of a bigger guy. And so he had one of those wheelie chairs, like, you know, like an office chair. 
and he would ask us to push him around on his chair. He was like a big guy. Like he didn't want to get up and go to the chalkboard or right on the board or the whiteboard. He would ask us to, to scoot him. Then he had one of these long uh, like meter yardsticks, a ruler, and he would push himself around on his chair. <laughs> Mr. Sipsy. Another thing I remember is that he was an English teacher, and consistently he would mispronounce words and, like, fumble over words. And it was like, and then the third thing I remember, I don't remember anything else from this class, but I remember this one book. And it was an exceptionally long and boring book that we read in the class. It was, like, required reading. Maybe you've read it before. I think it's a, a, I think it's a famous book. Uh, I don't remember, honestly, I can't right now remember any other books that I read through high school. Now I love reading books. I read as many as I can in the year. I have a goal that I set to listen to or to read. But I remember this book from about 20 years ago it is now. One part of the story in the book, you may have heard of it, it's called Homer's Odyssey. You ever heard of that book? It's an old book. It's a long story about, you heard of the story of Troy. You remember Brad Pitt and Troy, and he, you know, he cuts Achilles thing, and he kills the guy. Remember that? Come on. Right? Okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to draw you in here a little bit. Are you guys with me? You're like, Homer's Odyssey, I don't know it, I don't get it. In the book, there's a, a, there's a part of the book, again, I don't know why I remember this, but it applies today, is that the men, they go and they conquer in Troy, and then there's a storm that comes, and it, they're, they're, they get on their ships, and the storm comes, and it carries them to the place in a land called the Land of the Lotus Eaters. They get stranded on this island. The men, the warriors, fighting and conquering and, and, and surviving battles, they get stranded on this island. And on the island, the native people offer them the fruit, the lotus fruit. And when the men eat the fruit, they don't want to do anything else but stay there and continue to eat the fruit. They're just so relaxed and peaceful. It's almost like maybe they did heroin or something like that. And they, they're there, they're stuck, they forget about the mission. They forget that they have a place beyond that island. They forget that there is an after. They forget that they're going somewhere else. They forget that there is a mission. And that's what happens to us sometimes. We get tempted and we taste the comforts of the world. And we begin to prioritize things in our life. Say, if I could only get this, I would like to stay here. This tastes so good, I would like to just eat of this forever. And it begins to take the priority. It begins to take precedence over everything else in my life. And so we come to the, the scripture that I want to open with today. Haggai chapter 1. We're going to read in verse 2 to 4. This is important because I think not only generally do we come and we taste of different things in the world and we're, we're pulled by our desires and we're pulled by our, maybe they're good intentions. Education is a good thing. Getting a good career is a good thing. But when it takes precedence over what God wants me to do, it becomes a bad thing. I think, actually, maybe I'm not even preaching to you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach to a spirit that I believe that has settled over the church in general. Maybe this doesn't even fit for you. Maybe you're on board and you're excited and you're, God is moving in your life. God is always number one from when you wake up to when you go to sleep. God bless you. Amen. Pray, come pray for me after the service. But I think what happened in 2020, right, you remember the pandemic, everybody remembers that. What happened in that season of the world, not just the church here, but all over the world, is it freed us up to taste of the world and these things that we had been busy missing out on. In those two or three years that it really impacted, we got to spend more time with family. Hello. Got to take, uh, once you got free, you were able to take more trips. I remember in America... We were taking trips all the time. They didn't have us locked down the same as here. But you couldn't work and you couldn't go to church, but you could still travel around. Like, man, this is great. And then they sent us a check because we couldn't work. Say, here, here's a weekly check. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is great. We don't got to do nothing. We can spend time with family. We can go do what we want. We can travel around. Oh, this is great. What else do we need? 
I believe that settled something over not just the whole world, but I think specifically over the church. And we got to taste areas of our lives that we could prioritize other things other than Christ. Also, what happened is that because we had to miss out on church or only watch online, it became a good reason to not have to come here anymore. If you're here today, that's a blessing. God bless you. We're glad that you're here. But something happened is we got to taste and see my world didn't fall apart when I stopped going to church. That began to creep in and that began to settle over our hearts and our lives. It's okay if I miss. Who's going to miss me? It's all right. I can watch online. I'll catch it up later. I don't need to come and serve in the house of God. They don't need me anymore. You ever felt like this? We get to this, the scripture right here, Haggai chapter, Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. It says, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses and this temple to be in ruins? This morning, I didn't come here to say, hey, you don't do enough. I didn't come here to say, you need to try harder, you need to serve. I didn't come for that. But I believe this is a message in the right time, in the right season. It's like an alarm clock. What is your alarm clock sound? Beep, 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 beep. This is an alarm clock message. In this, God says, consider your ways. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here faithfully every Sunday. Praise God for you. Maybe you're serving. Maybe you're plugged in. Maybe you're doing what you think God should t- has you to do right now. Praise God for you. But this is the alarm clock, consider your ways message. Does this carry into every area of my life? Is God preeminent in every sin? In my marriage, is God number one? In my business, is God number one? In my education, is God number one? Is God priority in every area, or do I just come and tick a box? Do I check into the club and then check back out? This is what's happening here. We see in Haggai, just a little background of what's taking place. The Israelites, they return from captivity, a remnant of people. Just like here, there's a remnant. Before 2019, this thing, I've heard stories. I've only been here for a few months. You guys were busting at the seams. You had to rent, uh, there was the Super Sundays. You guys remember Super Sundays? And things were going great. And now there's a, re- a remnant. People have come back after COVID. This is the remnant. And the people came back and they came back to, the, to, to Jerusalem and they began to build the temple after it was destroyed. And then they stop. People come. Start building, they come back after being captive in Babylon. And then they stop because of hardship, because of toil, because of tarrying. It was taking too long because the enemy was present. The people come back from Babylon and they complete the foundation of the temple and they complete the altar. And then they stop. We can worship, we got our foundation, we're good. That's as far as we're going to take it now. Now I want to focus on my stuff. It's not going fast enough in the temple. I want to begin to prioritize me. I want to begin to, who's going to take care of me? I've asked this question before. Who's going to take care of me? I remember we we, we directed the home, Alexis and I, in Reno for three years, 2013 to 2016. After we, we, we got shifted out of the home, the hardest season when you're the director of the men's home or the women's home, you're getting calls all the time. You're always needed. People are calling, hey, can you come help us do this? Can you, come, can you give us a ride over here? Can you do this? And then once you're not the director, no calls. No calls. And then I went through a season of, man, who's going to take care of me? I gave all this time, three years, living in person in the men's home with 12 to 15 smelly guys. I did this for you, Lord. Who's going to take care of me now? I did my part. I did so much. Who's going to take care of me? And I began to, I'm going to take care of me then. 
I'm going to do what I got to do. And then I began to make excuses for, well, I don't have to come to this meeting. I don't have to be at this, I don't have to be at the church at this time. I don't got to be at this practice. I don't got to do this. I don't got to do this or that because I got to take care of me. And this is where we see the Israelites at is they said, now we got to take care of me. Let us, who's going to build our house? Who's going to build my house? I got to build my own house. But we see the people here. Recognizing they have a place to worship, the altar, the foundations are built. Got my biblical, I'm going to finish the foundation class after this. I'm good. I don't got to put any more effort in. And they begin to focus on building their own houses. Again, it's not a bad thing. You know, he says, is it a time for you to live in your paneled houses? It's all right. Praise God for the paneled houses. That's the extravagance, that's, that's the wood that was, it was nice, it was, you know, the, the stuff that should have been in the temple was now in their house. It's not a bad thing, but it, when the house or when the, the, the house of the Lord is missing those things and your house has it, then God begins to look and say, hey, consider your ways. What about my house? What about building the temple? Another thing I notice here is, Never want God to say through the prophet, this people. These people. The challenge they face, and I think we face a similar challenge today, is that comfort, distraction, self gratification. I want what I want. Why didn't they do it? That's the question. I know it's quiet in here, but uh, this this stuff is important. Why didn't they do it? While the land was desolate, the Bible says, we don't have time to read through the whole chapter, but you can read through it. The land was desolate. The crops weren't producing like they should have. They began to say, oh, it was easier before I started coming to church. It was easier before I had to prioritize Christ in my life. It was easier when I handled things on my own. At least I knew what I was going to get on my check every week. At least I knew what I was going to have to expect. At least I knew. Maybe they stopped the work because there wasn't enough eligible people. They got tired. It was a remnant. It was a small group. They come back and it's time to rebuild and it's time to go all in. And then it's like, man, where is everybody at? I feel like I'm doing this. I feel like I'm involved in everything. I feel like I'm the only one. You want to hear some of their uh, possible excuses? You want to hear some of their possible excuses? See what it sounds like? Maybe you've heard these before. They didn't say this, but this is possible. There's not, this is them, there's not a lot of progress going on right now at the temple, and my house needs some work. I might as well, might as well focus on my stuff. Who else is going to focus on me? Sometimes we want the work in the house of God. We want to just go fast. Remnant, where the people have come back after the season of hardship, and we're here and we want to see it explode again. Then we look around, man, who's there? not enough workers for this. There's not enough people for that. Maybe I'll just pull back and I'll do what I need to do. Or here's another one. You ever heard this excuse? God knows my home is important. He knows my house needs work. God understands home comes first. God would want me to prioritize my Make it sound spiritual. I would give more time to the temple, but all my money is tied up in personal renovations. I'd like to give more, but uh, I'm in a building project right now in my own house. I'd like to give more, but I just bought this super nice car and uh, the payment is too high. It's not like I'm living extravagant. Look at all these other houses. I could be doing better. It's never enough. Or here's one. Somebody should step up and build the house of God. 
Why isn't anybody doing this? Why isn't anybody helping in this area? I wish they did this. I wish they would play this music. I wish they would have a different that. I wish that there would be this to offer. There's a little uh, story. It goes like this. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. They say, this isn't the right time for me. Things will be better later. Look at their excuse. There is that this is not the time. They wouldn't dare say, we don't want to build the temple. They would just say, it's not the time. When I finish my degree, when I finish, get a better, when I get a promotion, when my kids are grown, when, I, when this is better, when the situation is right, I'll give more. I'll do more. I'll, fo- I'll prioritize God more when this is done. You ever felt like that? This is a hard word today. Woo! I'm the hard word preacher. Finances and priorities, come on. But look at what was happening because they didn't do it. Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and you bring in little. You ever, uh, this ever happened to you? When you begin to say, where did my money go? I made this money. Where did it go? You eat, but you don't have enough. Woo, you're never full. You're never satisfied. I remember I felt like, you ever felt like this before? I felt like this before. When I wasn't prioritizing the kingdom of God. It was before I actually even knew Christ and I was doing real well. I had a good career. I was an underwater welder making too much money for a person my age. And I could have anything I wanted. I didn't have a desire for anything. Hey, where do you want to go eat tonight? Uh, have all the nicest food that we could get. I wasn't satisfied. When God is not our priority, nothing satisfies our heart. And then we begin to turn to other things. Well, maybe the food, maybe if I make more money, maybe if I invest this way, maybe if I just start this venture, maybe if I get married, hello. Maybe if I have kids, it'll get better. Maybe if I do this, it'll get better. He says, you eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled. You clothe yourselves, but nobody is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Or Jesus. These judgments, what God was saying through Haggai, were a consequence that came from forgetting God and not prioritizing him. This is just a, God is just reminding the people what he had already told them in Deuteronomy. He said, when you get into the land and you're blessed and I'm taking care of you and I'm the king, I'm God, and you're, you're blessed out of your socks, don't forget about me. Deuteronomy, he said, don't forget about me. If you forget about me, these exact things will begin to happen in your life. And so the Lord comes and tells Haggai, remind them what I told them all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. It's going this way because you forgot to prioritize me. Wherever you're at in your situation this morning, whatever it is that you're facing today, remember to prioritize the presence of God. Remember to prioritize the house of God. Remember to prioritize the mission of God. What does he have for you to do? If any of these things begin to align in your life, you say, man, you know what? I do feel empty. I don't feel satisfied. I do feel like there's something more. I do feel like my money is uh, not there when I go to look for it. He says, come back and prioritize. Remember. Read it later, Deuteronomy 11. Why was it important to build the house of the Lord? Why would God come out of all this and say, hey, I was thinking, 
David wanted to build, King David, he wanted to build a house for the Lord, and God said no. Remember that? David came and he said, I, I, I feel like God, I'm living in this grand house, and I want to build it. And God said, no, you're not the one. And then we come here, years, hundreds of years later, and it is a priority to God now. And he's saying, why aren't you guys building my house? Why aren't you doing what I've called you to do? Why aren't you doing this? The significance of completing the temple. The temple symbolized the presence of God. You're not prioritizing the presence of God, he was telling them. He was telling the people, he was telling the Israelites. Building the temple represented the people's commitment to God. They pulled away and they began to build their own thing and they were committed to themselves. And then the temple was to remind the people of God's future promises. There is a beyond this. This isn't all it's about. But this is a place where God is glorified. This is a place where people could come and say, man, this is the God that I want to serve. This is the place where I can meet with God. This is the place where I could experience who God is in my life. But they didn't do it, and they were living under the curse. So Haggai comes and says, hey, wake up. Here's the alarm. Pay attention. Consider your ways. Am I number one in every area? Why am I saying all this? Because I believe we get tempted to fall away. We get tempted to get distracted. We get temp- tempted by the comfort. And there's a, work, there's a work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. I know you're watching the news or you're, you're catching glimpses on YouTube. Or things are happening in the world and things are going crazy and there's a work to be done. And here I am trying to build my paneled house. Bro. 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 Bro, it's not going to last forever. This is not going to be here. We're, we're building towards something that we're not going to have. Take a moment real quick and imagine in 100 years. Put some stuff in perspective. Whatever it is that's so important to you right now, in 100 years, absolutely nobody is going to care. That's heavy, isn't it? Absolutely nobody. Nobody. What if we woke up every morning and we took that thought to the Lord, like, man, Lord, help me to focus on you. What you want me to do today? It's easy for us to get distracted. I get it. I get it. It's easy to get distracted. There is a lot of stuff that we need to focus on. There is a lot of stuff that needs our attention. I'm not saying push everything to the side and just live like a free spirit and whatever, God, you want me to do, I'm just going to sit here until you tell me to move. It's not realistic. That's not life. I get that. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying blow off everything and all your responsibilities and Oh, you have responsibilities. You got to do, you got to take care of business. You got to pay bills. You got to put a a roof over your head. You got to do those things. I get it. I'm a missionary. I need family time too. I need date night also. I need a vacation also. I got mouths to feed also. I got relationships to build also. I get it. I want to, you know, further my education also. I get it, but not at the expense of prioritizing that above who God is in my life. Back to the lotus eaters. We're tempted by the fruit of the world. We're tempted by this. We're tempted by that. The comforts, the distractions of life. The question is, how can we prioritize in this environment? We're living in the land of the lotus eaters. These people that I mentioned in the beginning, we're living in that place. It's all around us. It's so easy. Here, watch. It's this easy. I was distracted to this whole message, man. You experienced this too. I'd get on YouTube, right, to play on some worship music. I just want to put some worship music on, set the atmosphere so I can begin to study. And an hour later, I'm still... 
still scrolling YouTube shorts. I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? I just lost an hour. And then right when I walk in, right, right when I lock in, Alexis walks in and wants to talk. I'm like, oh man. Because I got distracted. It's easy to get distracted. We go through, I get it. But how in this land of, of distraction, how in this time, how can we break through the spiritual lethargy? Lethargy or lethargy? We get just spiritually tired and sluggish. You ever get like that? You make that face too. Some of you make that face right now. Come on. It's all right. It's one of those words, man. A wake up call. Turn to first, uh, Second Peter chapter one. How do we break through? Break out of the spiritual lethargy. How do we break out of this? I believe we have some divine direction on what we should do. Because it comes to how do we build the temple today? What does that look like? Just come to church? Well, you're like, hey, good job, you're doing it. What does it look like to build the temple today? How does Haggai relate to today? There's no temple to build. We're not in Jerusalem on the, we're not building the actual temple, the third temple or whatever it is now. We're not doing that. What are we doing? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, do you not know that you are the temple? And then I believe the Bible also says is that Jesus, he is the head of the body, which is the church. So the question is, what am I doing to build the church? What am I doing to glorify God in this temple? And this word all comes home, and so I was stepping on your toes for the last 30 minutes, but I'm going to bring it home right here. This is where you begin to prioritize glorifying God in yourself and in the body of Christ. How is God glorified in you, and how is he glorified in this house? Let's read the scripture real quick. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ the Lord. I'm going to read a little bit, so hang with me. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Oh, my goodness. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How do we escape the corruption? We have received these divine and precious promises. We have received the grace and the power of God upon our lives. How do we escape it? We have received it. And then here it is. Ooh, this is good. I'm gonna, we're going to camp out right here, and then we'll be done. You ready? Verse 5, it says, But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these things become my priority, I will be fruitful. My life will be fruitful. God will work in you and through you. You will not lack. God will continue to provide and bless through your life. You will not be at the place of the Israelites that were lacking and saying, where is my money? I'm not satisfied. I eat, but I'm still hungry. I drink, but I'm still thirsty. When you prioritize these things in your life, God says, you will not be without. Let's look at these things. It gives us seven things. It goes quick on all of them, so don't worry. Seven? Woo, we've been here for 40 minutes. You still got seven points? Lord Jesus, help us. He says, add to your, with all diligence, this takes work, this takes effort, this takes discipline, this is intentionality. This isn't just sitting like a bump on a log and expecting God to move. It takes effort, it takes, okay, practically, find somebody that you could get connected into the house of God with. 
get into a life group, get into a ministry where you can begin to serve. He says, add to your faith with all diligence, add to your faith virtue. What does this mean? Moral excellence. The developing the character of Christ within your life. Give attention to this. Don't just come to church. Be more like Jesus. Don't just come to the house of the Lord. Become a man of God. Don't just come here on Sunday, but become a woman of God. Become a representative. Become an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Don't just come here and tick a box, but allow God to mold and to shape your life. Moral excellence means the pursuit of the moral will of God in every area of our lives. Values, attitudes, priorities, goals, purpose, devotion, Christ-like character at home. What do you like at home? What do you act like at home? How do you treat your wife? How do you treat your husband? How do you treat your kids? How do you treat the dog? Hello, somebody. In every area of our lives, developing it, be intentional about it, add to your faith the basic foundation of your saving faith, add to that Christ-likeness. Develop it. Allow God to mature you in your walk. One way that that happens is in serving. Still, to this day, one of my favorite scriptures when I first got saved, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. As a new believer, just getting, I'm like, I just want to know Jesus. He said, take, do my work. Put the yoke on you. Get involved, get connected somewhere so you can continue to develop and learn about who I am in your life. We want to learn and develop, but we just want to sit in the benches. We just want to sit back. We never get the experience of playing on the field if we only want to sit on the bench. You could be on the team, get the win, but you don't have the experience of playing. You don't have the experience that comes from that. Moral excellence, add to it, add to your basic, what is this, this is Galatians chapter 5, right? Fruit of the Spirit, is it being developed in your life? How does this get developed? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. How do we get this developed? Being in proximity to Christ, number one, praise God if you, you have your devotion time in the morning. But number two, being in proximity with other believers. Actually, being in proximity with other sinners. Hey, you want to develop? Get around some other sinners. Come on, somebody. You want to develop in your Christian character and your godliness and your moral virtue? Get around some people like yourself. And then you got to learn how to forgive. You got to learn how to be patient. You got to learn to be kind when you don't feel like being kind. Hello. You got to be what? got to continue to develop the relationship. This is why it's important to be in the house of God. This is why it's important to prioritize the, the house of the Lord and building the house. It's not just simply just be better. It's allow God to transform you. The power of his presence, through the power of his word, and through the power of the community. We sharpen each other. Romans 12, 1, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Number two, he says, add to virtue, add knowledge. Are you growing in your knowledge of who God is? Are you growing and developing in who God is in your life? Are you growing in what he's able to do? This is just a general, are you just, are you, do you get into your word? This is some basic stuff here. Are you in the house and then are you in the word? Are you applying it to your life? And then he says, self-control, add to knowledge, self-control. Mastering our personal desires putting down my desire and exalting his before my own. And he said, as to self-control, perseverance. Woo, can you persevere? Can you go through it? Can you be steadfast in the trial? Well, it's easy to do that when you have God in your life, you got moral character, you got other believers around you. It's difficult to do that when you're all on your own. It's difficult to do that when you don't have any knowledge of what God can do in your life. It's difficult to persevere through the trial and the, the challenge. It's hard to be unswerving when I got nobody that's keeping me straight. Then he says, patience add godliness. Word godliness means reverence and respect. 
the fear of the Lord, intentionally build this within our lives. We say that. We throw the term around, fear of the Lord, right? We like that in Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does that mean? Do we, do we grasp that? Do we understand that? It's a heavy term. It's a heavy thing to fear God. In a day and age and in a culture that just wants the God that loves. God is my friend. God is just my, my, my pal. God is my, he's my good, he's my good dad, which he is, but he's just a good dad and he loves me and cares for me. He's going to provide for all my needs. What about the fear of the awesome God, the one that created the universe, the one that has the power to do anything, the one that is holy and separated from every bit of wickedness, no impurity in it. What about the God that is above and beyond and bigger that can do exceedingly, abundantly all that I ask or imagine? What about the God that is holding all things together? What about that God? The thing is, we could love God, but if we don't fear him, it's easy to get caught in the comforts of this world. We could love God all day long and still be in habitual sin. I love God and he loves me. But do you fear what he's able to do? Do you fear the power that he has? This is the almighty God. And this is not just, you know, tiptoeing and being afraid, but it's respecting and understanding what he's able to do. At any moment, at any moment, he could just be done with me. And am I in the position for that to be ready to happen? It adds to godliness. That a life set apart unto God. Because of what he's done, because of who he is, I surrender my life to him. Add to godliness, brotherly kindness. Woo! You don't want to fall, you don't want to be stuck, you don't want to be chasing the things of the world, then add brotherly kindness. John 13, 35 says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How do we treat each other? Are we a family? Are we brothers and sisters? Is this the house of the Lord? And how do I treat my brothers and my sisters? Is there conflict in the house? Sometimes. But are we able to get over it? Are we able to get past it? I grew up with siblings, and we, we, we would go at it. But at the end of the day... Still siblings. At the end of the day, we still live in the same house. At the end of the day, we got the same dad. At the end of the day, I'll fight for you. At the end of the day, I got your back. Brotherly kindness. And then he says, add to that love. Just simple affection, goodwill. 1 Corinthians 13, they call it the love chapter. So many times we use this in, in weddings and you hear this and love is patient, kind, all these things, right? He said, add to brotherly kindness, love. Love for those all around. Oh, what is that love that you have emanating, coming from your life? The love, this is not only what we should apply to marriage, but it should be applied to every relationship that we come in. And then we go here, and we're almost done. Verse 9 in 2 Peter, or, yeah, 2 Peter chapter 1. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. I'm not intentional. I'm not pursuing up. I'm not adding to these things. I'm easily blinded by the things of the world. I'm easily blinded by the distraction. I'm easily removed by the comforts. I'm easily settled in my own self-pleasure. I don't want to be that way. God told Haggai to tell the people, consider your ways. You're here this morning. This is just the alarm. This is, not, this is not for condemnation. This is not saying, again, you don't do enough, you're not good enough. This is for contemplation. 
Is Jesus who he is supposed to be in my life? Is he that person in my life? Is he preeminent? Is he first in every area? Am I living a life that glorifies him? Does my life reflect his glory? Okay, ready to end in just a moment, but we turn to the, the lotus eaters. They wanted to stay on the island, eat the fruit. Their captain, their leader, had to come and chain them up dragged them back to the boat. Otherwise, they would have stayed, not made it home. They forgot about home. They forgot about the mission. They forgot about Moses. I feel like it's important for me to tell you today is that this is not your home. It's easy for us to get distracted and want to build like this is forever. This is not forever. Hebrews 13, he says, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Just this morning, I'm gonna, I gotta tell you this. Praying this morning, my son, Levi, he comes downstairs. Uh, I got worship on the TV. He comes in. He's cute. He's only six. He's got a Minecraft piggy blanket. You guys know about Minecraft. And he's got this little thing. He's just wrapped up. He's got a pig head on top. And he comes and he just snuggles right next to me, bro. We're there. And I'm just singing worshiping. And I'm just getting ready for the word. And then he says like this. He says, Dad, I'm afraid to die six years old. And it didn't shock me. It wasn't like, oh, this kid is wrong. You know, there's something psychologically. But instead, I just said, what are you afraid of? And about a year ago, we, we lost a close friend. He had, his name was Sammy. He died in a tragic accident. About 40 years old. You know, kids, uh, kids that were the same age as Levi and Owen and Go and spend time with them. And Levi remembers this event, tragic event. He said, why, why are you afraid to die, Levi? He said, I don't want to be like Sammy. And I don't want to be put in a box. I'm like, whoa. That's heavy. I'm there studying for this message, and he comes and he says, I don't want to be put into a box. But I said, hey, Levi. When Jesus is in your life, when you've accepted him and his forgiveness, he's there, he's snuggled with me right there, man. Your body stays in the box, but you go home. This is not our home. This is not your home. If you're building like this is home, then the box is all you have to look forward to. Father, in the name of Jesus, my prayer this morning for all of us here today. Is that we would prioritize your presence. We would prioritize your glory. We would prioritize your mission. What a heavy thing to reveal to us. I pray for everybody that's living for the box. For whatever reason, distraction, circumstance, seasons of life, we, we get focused on this is all that there is. Snap us out of that. This is our wake-up call. There's so much to be done. Locally, in this house, in this church, in this body, reflecting your glory and your image in our lives, there's so much to be done. And I pray that we would move from a place of living for the box to living for your kingdom. Looking ahead of, to what is to come. 
we thank you that there is a to come. We thank you that it doesn't end here. We thank you that this is not it. We thank you that you have so much more. We thank you for your exceedingly great and precious promises for us. Shift priorities this morning. We come against that spirit that tried to settle over our hearts. That you will break it. Comfort. Desire. Self-gratification. Break through all those things. That we will prioritize your kingdom. We will prioritize you and the people around us. And that we would build your temple. We would see you glorified. Let's all stand in this place for just a moment. It's a real heavy atmosphere. It's a real heavy way to end, but just, just right there where you're at. I believe what God wants to say to us today, similar to what he told Haggai, the people of Israel, consider your ways. Consider your ways. I can't consider for you, but I can consider for me. What is it? Just every head bowed, every eye closed, or maybe even if you want to lift your hands, consider your ways. What is it that's taking precedence in my marriage, in my family, in my career, in my education, in my finances, in, my, in every area? Consider your ways. Is Christ glorified in all of your ambitions? Is he the preeminent one? Is he first place in every pursuit? Consider your ways. Hallelujah. I want to open up the altars and they're going to sing this song. And if you've been ministered to and you... Actually, no, come up and consider your ways. The purpose of coming up is you're responding. That's the response. You can stay in your seat, but also you can come forward and respond to how God has ministered to you. I'm just a mouthpiece. I'm just the alarm clock this morning. But they're going to play this song, and I want to invite you to come up and just spend a moment.